and we're slowly getting out of lockdown. So I hope you're keeping well wherever you are. In this lesson, what we're doing, we're looking at reading part C. Um, and we're going to look at some reading skills which you might find useful in the OET reading exam. So these are called GIST detail inference. And this is what we're going to look at in these, this lesson. And we're going to do a couple of uh, practice tasks as well. Uh, so let's have a look then. Let's keep going. Just to let you know also um, on our uh, website, if you go to wles.net, we've got 20% off all our courses. Um, that's only until the 15th of March. So you've only got another week. So if you want to check it out, wles.net, 20% uh, off all courses. That's online courses, face to face. Uh, one to one, pretty much everything. Okay, but let's get cracking. Um, let's start because really we want to look at uh, this reading paper and these reading skills. And it's not an easy skill uh, reading. It's a lot trickier than, than people realize. In the OET exam, I'm sure most of you know that we have uh, part A, reading part A, it's 15 minutes. And you've got parts B and C, which are 45 minutes. And these come together, parts B and C. It's really up to you how you allocate your time. In part A, your, the skills that you need really are skimming and scanning. You need to be able to skim read really quickly and you need to be able to scan words or scan synonyms. Um, and these are the skills that, that are really gonna help you. But parts B and C are different. You don't need skimming and scanning really what's going to help you just detail and also inference as well. So they're different types of reading and um, this is what we're going to look at today, just detail and inference. Just a quick reminder of what part C is. I'm sure most of you know this, that part C, it's, um, it's specific actually, it says here general, sorry, it should say specific to all professions. So whether you're a doctor, uh, a nurse, a physiotherapist, um, a pharmacist, you're all doing the same paper. You're going to be reading two longer texts. It's multiple choice questions, A, B, C, and D. Uh, and like I said, the skills you've tested on just detail and inference can help as well. So what is inference then? Let's have a quick look at inference. Well, it's a noun we've got here and the verb is to infer. It's a regular verb. The past is ed then. So uh, inferred in the past. And just some synonyms of infer, uh, imply, suggest, or speculate. There's probably quite a few more actually, there's probably quite a lot of synonyms in fact, but they're kind of similar words and, and these kind of give you an idea about what inference is. Essentially what it is, it's when you're making a guess, but you're making an educated guess. You're actually guessing and your guess is based on evidence. So this is something really useful for reading part C because the answers are never so direct. They're never that obvious. And sometimes you're gonna actually have to try to work out. You're gonna to have to infer what the writer is telling you. Here's a quick task here. Um, you can see this picture, hopefully. What could you infer about this person? Okay, just take a second and think, well, what could you infer? I think the most obvious thing most people say is he's just been shopping. And that's a reasonable statement to make. But what you're doing is you're inferring. We don't actually know for sure if he's been shopping. It's possibly he's, he's with his partner and he's just been given the, his uh, partner's shopping bags and he's waiting for her. Um, but we're inferring, we're making an educated guess. You can see the picture, you can see the shopping bags. You're not just kind of making a guess out of the blue. There's evidence there. And that's the important thing. And that's what you need when you're gonna infer. You're gonna make a choice. You've got A, B, C, or D. Sometimes you're gonna infer, but you're doing that, you're inferring and it's based on evidence. And that's really important. Let's have a look at an example of an inference question. And then we're gonna do a couple of tasks. Here. Okay, this comes from a, a reading. You can see the heading here. It's about allergies, allergic to eating. This is the question. It says, what does the paragraph suggest about the transference of allergies between mother and child? 
Now, in a way, you know that the answer isn't going to be so direct, because when you look at the verb, and it's always worth looking at the verbs in the question, uh, because you really got to understand the question. And one mistake people make is that they don't really, they kind of skim read the question, but you've got to really read the question carefully and pay attention to the verbs. You can see here the verb is suggest. So it's not going to be that direct. You're going to have to read between the lines, if you like. You're going to have to maybe infer a little bit. Let's have a look here. It says the transference of allergies between mother and child. This is really what you need to do as well uh, with the, the reading paper. You've got to be clear on the question. You need to make sure you understand what they are asking of you, because if you don't, you're, you're kind of going to get confused with the answer options. And that's what they do, not just with OET, but with IELTS and even in the Cambridge exams. They'll often confuse you with the, with the answer options. So, you know, you've got to focus on the transfer of allergies between mother and child. That's really what you're looking for here. Let's have a look at the paragraph. It says here, there is evidence that allergens can be transferred through a mother's breast milk to her child and possibly through the placenta. Since the immaturity of babies' immune systems might make them more vulnerable to an inherited allergic tendency, women in allergic families could be advised to avoid certain foods during pregnancy and breastfeeding. It is possible though that some allergies or intolerances are purely imaginary and this can also have consequences for children. One US study found that parents sometimes avoided foods to which they erroneously believed their children were allergic, occasionally leaving the children severely underfed. Okay, now there's a reason why I've just read the paragraph before showing you the answer options. And one reason is because if you can really understand the paragraph, it makes the answer options easier. Um, remember, this is reading comprehension and comprehension means to comprehend, to understand. And if you can really understand the paragraph, it does make the answer options easier. So we've got the question, we've, we've looked at the paragraph. Here are the answer options. And I'll just give you a few seconds just to quickly read through these answer options. OK, um, some of you, you might want to type your answers in, into the chat. Some of you um, might want to give it a go. Um, and let's just quickly look at it together. We'll do a couple of tasks in a moment. The first sentence, really, what it does, it kind of introduces the question, and that's what you notice a lot about reading part C. Every time you have a paragraph, or not every time, but often you'll have a paragraph, and they kind of introduce the question at the beginning of the paragraph. This isn't really telling you a lot, just saying, telling us that there's evidence that um, allergies can be transferred um, when a woman is pregnant through her best breast milk, and also through the placenta, uh, having given birth as well. The second sentence here gives us a bit more information and it's really just telling us that when um, well, a baby's immune system isn't properly developed, they're kind of vulnerable to allergies. Um, so sometimes if, you're, if, you're, um, if you've got an allergy uh, and, and you're pregnant, you're probably better off avoiding that allergy. Um, that's all it's really telling us. Then the final sentence, the final two sentences, it's just telling us that uh, talks about uh, an American study where some people thought that they, they were, um, they thought they had allergies. They've got that word erroneously, so they were wrong. They didn't actually have allergies and they avoid giving their children food um, because they think they're allergic to it. And what happens is their children are severely underfed then. And you might see this word here, malnourishment and underfed. And you've got to be really careful. Sometimes people will rush and, and be just because you can see something in the paragraph, you think it's the answer. But don't forget the question. The question is asking you about the transference of allergies between mother and child here. This is kind of talking about afterwards as well. And so it's talking about after the birth and you can see the word imaginary. It's not even a, a real uh, allergy. So you're wrong if you thought it was answer B. 
Looking at the first sentence here, it says evidence that allergens can be transferred. Again, you might think it's uh, answer D, most likely to take place, can be transferred. They're similar, but they're not the same. So if you did think the answer was D, again, the answer is wrong. Small differences there. Okay, the next sentence here, really it was telling us that, well, babies' immune systems uh, they aren't properly developed, so they are vulnerable to allergy. So really, if you avoid, uh, if you've got an allergy, uh, let's say to peanuts, then just avoid eating peanuts altogether. Um, and what that is telling you now, this is where the inference comes and you're having to infer because really what it's telling you is that, well, if you take precautions like this, if you, you've got an allergy to peanuts and if you actually take the precaution, don't eat peanuts, well, then the chances are your baby won't have that allergy. Now you can see here, it's not a direct statement. The author isn't actually saying this, but they're kind of implying this, they're suggesting it. In other words, they're inferring this. And this is what you're gonna to have to do sometimes in reading part C. Uh, even though the writer doesn't say it, it's something that's being suggested in the text. Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to do a couple of questions. So we're going to do two questions. You're going to see the question and then you're going to see the text. And then you've got one minute to read the text. After you read the text, you've got, you'll see the answer options and you've got one minute, another minute to answer the question. So you've got two minutes in total. There are two questions as well. And then we're going to analyze this together. Okay, guys, so good luck. This is question one. You can see it's about uh, allergies again. And this is your question. Okay, and here's your paragraph. And you've got a minute to read the paragraph. Guys, so you can see the answer options. You've got another minute now to, to find the answer. Okay, and just down to 10 seconds. I know some of you got your answers in, in the chat. Feel free to, to put your answers in. Okay, um, so let's have a look. Oh, sorry, question two, I forgot there are two questions. Same kind of thing. This is about the prenatal origins of heart disease. This is your question. And this is the paragraph. Again, just a minute to read this and then a minute you'll see the answer options.
Okay, so you can see the answer options now, and you've got a minute to find the answer. And remember, you're going to have to infer as well. The answer isn't going to be direct. You're going to have to try to kind of read between the lines to, to get the answer. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Um, the answers, the first text, it was about allergies. You might remember, this is allergies to, to eating. Well, just gonna direct you to the sentence in the middle of the paragraph. In fact, when you read this, you might have noticed the synonym. Uh, the question Dr. Souter suggests in the text, Dr. Souter speculates, really kind of similar. And also here, the rise in cases of one allergy in the paragraph, a rise in peanut allergy cases. Okay, so when you see that, you know you're reading something significant. You know here, you've really got to read carefully. If you go on reading here, the writer talks about uh, peanut allergies. This is what the writer is talking about. It says greater exposure has probably allowed more peanut allergies to flourish. Again, um, well, uh, peanut allergies which flourish, an important vocabulary there, and something flourishes, it kind of blossoms, it grows. So peanut allergies on the rise. Um, but we also need to think, well, why? And you can see the word due to. So why? That's really what the question is asking you. Why are peanut allergies increasing? And that's what I mean. If you can really understand the question, and understand what they're asking of you, it makes your life easier. So it's just so important to read the question carefully. If we go on reading as well, the writer explains that peanut consumption per capita is rising, so we're eating more peanuts. It's a common ingredient in Asian and vegetarian dishes which have grown in popularity, and the diet conscious, the diet conscious population is increasingly turning to nuts as a source of healthy fats. Okay, so we're going to infer here. There's nothing in the answer options actually which says anything here, but there is something which is implied and what the writer is kind of implying or inferring, what the writer is saying here, well, we think peanuts are healthy, so actually we're consuming more and more peanuts because we want to have a healthy lifestyle. What that is doing is that it's actually increasing allergies. So that leaves you really with answer option A. The reason that allergies, peanut allergies are rising is because we're trying to improve eating habits because we think peanuts are healthy, which they are, in fact. But you can see here how you had to infer. The writer didn't say in the paragraph that we're trying to, uh, people are trying to improve their eating habits. They just say the diet conscious population um, are eating nuts because they're healthy. It's a similar kind of thing, and, and you can kind of see what the writer is trying to tell you. But it's not direct as well. And you, and you kind of, if you use inference, it can really help you. So the answer here was option A. Let's have a look at the second question. This was about heart disease, but prenatal origins of heart disease. So really be, the origins of heart disease kind of before you're born, it's quite interesting this. And you can see in the question here, it says suggest, so if you pay attention to the verbs, you know it's not gonna be direct uh, and you're gonna to have to infer. And again, focus on the question. This is what they're asking you. They're talking about the work of the international research community. You might be reading a lot of things in the paragraph, but this is really what you wanna focus on here. The work of the international research community. So I've highlighted some words here. It says it talks about fetuses susceptibility to disease. And again, um, susceptibility, it's important 
to have a good vocabulary in reading. Um, in fact, for the whole of the OET exam, for the listening paper as well, um, you really, really need a rich and, and a broad vocabulary because if you don't know these words, uh, sometimes it, it can really kind of make your life harder. So when you're preparing for the OET exam, please really use it as an opportunity to widen your vocabulary. So here it says fetuses susceptibility to disease in later life. So um, in later life, how vulnerable you are to a disease, it starts as a, as a fetus, that's what it's saying, by conditions in the womb. And you can see here it talks about the international research community. This is what they focused on. Okay, and it says here, considerable efforts concentrating on nutrient supply across the placenta as a risk factor. So that's what the international research community focused on. They focused on nutrients uh, across the placenta um, when they're looking at disease in later life from a fetus. If we read on, it says here that's just part of the story. How much, how much oxygen is available to the fetus is also a determinant of growth and of the risk of adult disease. So we're moving away now from the work of the international research community. The author is telling us it's not just about nutrients. There's something else important here, and that's oxygen as well. OK, and then it goes on to talk about Dr. Dino Giussani's research group. And this research group really focuses on oxygen and fetal development. So it's kind of moving away from nutrients. Okay, so like I said before, the, the work of the international research community, that's really what it was asking you about. And you can see here, they focus on nutrient supply, um, but the author's telling you, well, you know, it's only half the story. There's a lot more to it and they focused on oxygen as well. So what you can infer is that the focus of their research, their research has been too narrow. Again, you're inferring here, the writer doesn't actually say that. The writer doesn't say that the international research community, that their, their work is too narrow. And but that's kind of what the writer is saying, it just they, they, they don't say it. So you've got to infer You've got to try and understand what's being uh, implied here. And also, as you go through the answer options, uh, you'll notice that all of them are slightly inaccurate as well. OK, let's move on. So inference is something really useful and it's a, it's a good skill to have, I think, in reading part C and also in reading part B as well. Now, there's a couple of questions. There's gist and detail. We're gonna look at detailed uh, questions. I've got direct, it's actually detailed questions we're looking at here. This is where you focus on one part of the text and you can find that answer in a specific part of text. So these are detailed questions. You don't have to get the answer from the whole paragraph. Actually, you can get it maybe from a sentence or from half a paragraph. But having said that, it is really important to read the whole paragraph. Okay, let's have a look at a couple of examples. Well, we'll look at one example and we'll do some practice. Allergic to eating. So we're gonna stay with allergies at the moment. It says here uh, in the fifth paragraph, what point is made about the two hypotheses mentioned? Okay, this is the paragraph. Broadly speaking, Dr. Souter says the ideal recipe for a food allergy is to be born of allerg allergic parents and then to have a high exposure to an allergenic foodstuff. But there are so many exceptions to this rule that other forces are clearly at work. And who's to say what high exposure is anyway? In contrast, the so-called hygiene hypothesis suggests too low an exposure to allergens is to blame. The idea is that today's clean environments leave our immune system with too little to do, encouraging them to, to turn, sorry, encouraging them to turn on the wrong culprits. Clearly, the field of immunology has only just scratched the surface of understanding. OK, so once again, you can see I've taken away the answer options and it's for the same reason. It's just so you can really focus on the paragraph and really understand what the author, what the writer is trying to tell you. Here are the answer options. 
Uh, just take a few uh, seconds just to read through these and feel free to type in your answer in, into the chat. Okay, so this time it's really a detailed question and, and you're gonna find now the answer directly in the text here. First of all, it says, what point? Now, like I said, you've got to read the questions carefully. It's not asking for the main point, which is sometimes what they do. Um, it just wants one point and it wants one point about two hypotheses. Now, you know, you've got to find two hypotheses to understand, to get the answer correct. You need to understand what are these two hypotheses? There's two theories, basically. Uh, what are they? Well, if we look at this and just break up the text a little bit, it says here the ideal recipe for a food allergy is to be born of allergic parents, then to have a high exposure to an allergenic foodstuff. So let's say your parents are um, allergic to peanuts. And then when you grow up, you eat a lot of peanuts. So this is saying you're much more likely to be allergic than to peanuts, for example. And this word is really important. In the middle, it says in contrast and just picking up on little words because it's going to tell you something um, which is the opposite. And you can see in answer option B, you've got a synonym. You've got something which contradicts, contradicts contradict and contrast, they're, they're fairly similar things. So in contrast, we're now we've got the second hypothesis. We've got the second theory. It says here, the so-called hygiene hypothesis suggests too low an exposure to allergens is to blame. So it's almost the opposite of the first uh, theory. The first theory kind of says, well, you know, you have too much exposure to, to these peanuts. This theory is saying, well, you don't have enough and then you will have an allergy. So they kind of contradict each other. And that is really where the answer is. And you can find the answer is answer option B. But this is also what we mean really by a detailed question. The answer is directly in the text and you can actually see uh, the answer quite clearly. It's expressed in a different way to the answer option, for example, the writer in the text isn't going to say these two hypotheses directly contradict each other. It's never that easy. They're going to use synonyms or similar words or they'll rephrase things. Uh, but with direct questions, you can find the answer in the text. Like I said, really to get the answer, that's all I needed to read. I didn't actually need to understand to read the whole text. Um, However, like I said, it is important you do read the whole paragraph. Even if you think you found the answer, just keep reading because these questions are really tricky. Okay, so let's do a bit of practice. So just like before, there are two questions and um, you're gonna see the question, you'll have the paragraph, you've got a minute and then you'll see the answer options. This is about heart disease. Okay, what information can be found in the paragraph? This is the paragraph. The time has started and you'll see the answer options after a minute. Okay, guys, you can see the answer option. Um, you should be able to find the answer um, directly in the text.
Okay, and you've got let's see question two also about prenatal origins of heart disease. This is the question. Your paragraph. Again, you've got a minute to read this, and then you'll see the the answer options. Okay, guys, and these are your answer options. So you've just got a minute to, to figure out the, the answer. Feel free to type your answers into the chat as well. Okay, so let's have a look at the answers. And just be clear, these are detailed questions. It did say direct, actually should say detailed. Don't, don't, don't be confused. Uh, it pretty much means the same thing, that the answer is actually in the text, in a specific part of the text. And what it says here, the first question, what information can be found? So these questions are specific. It's really asking you about information that is in the paragraph. That's really what it wants. And you're gonna find this in the actual paragraph. This talked about heart disease, in fact, um, across the world. And it gave an example in Australia, it said that 30% uh, of all deaths are to do with heart disease. And so the, really the first sentence is telling you, be careful because if you look at option D, some people see the country with the highest mortality rate. But it didn't say that. It didn't say Australia has the highest mortality rate. It just tells you that 30% of all deaths in Australia are to do with heart disease. So if you did think D, you would have been incorrect. Just got to read the questions really carefully. It talks here about the next sentence really talks about uh, traditional risk factors with heart disease. Things like uh, smoking, obesity, uh, genes as well, um, genetics. And again, you might think that the answer is option B. It talks about the greatest risk factor in option B, but it's a little bit different. In the text, it's talking about traditional risk factors. It doesn't say anything about the greatest risk factor at all. Um, the answer wasn't option B. At the end, it tells you that there is something else becoming apparent now, uh, that as well as these traditional risk factors such as smoking and obesity and genes, it tells you actually um, before birth, there's something, and just at the end, it talks about interaction with the quality of our prenatal environment. So while you're still in the womb, basically, this could actually have an effect uh, on whether you have heart disease later on in life. Um, if you look at option C, misconception about the chief causes, um, again, vocabulary is important because the misconception, if you don't know that word, it kind of means that, that you don't hear it. Um, it's saying that we had a misunderstanding of what has caused heart disease. But that's not what the writer is saying, in fact. Okay, we know the answer is going to be answer option A. 
And you can see really why, if you just look at the end here, um, the writer says it's now becoming apparent. It's a recent finding. It's now becoming apparent. You can kind of see how the language is different. It's kind of synonymous. It's similar. Um, it's saying the same kind of thing, but in different words. And the recent finding. So what is the recent finding? Well, it's just as we said now, um, rather than kind of just focusing just on smoking or obesity or on your genes with heart disease. Now you can actually look at when uh, as a fetus, you're still in the womb and the conditions in the womb as well, which could affect later on in life your your um, chances of, of getting heart disease. Okay, so that was a detailed question. You can kind of see uh, it's a specific part of the text. Even though you have to read the whole text, the answer has come just from really the last uh, sentence, in fact. This is the second detailed question. Um, and again, really focusing on the question here, it's asking you about the assumption. That's really what it wants to know. And that's what you need to find in the text. You need to find the assumption. Um, now that word may have helped you once you saw this word assume well you you know you're reading something significant here you know you're reading something really important and you've just got to really read carefully you're reading here for detail um, you're looking specifically for information you need to know what the assumption is well if you read here this is the assumption is telling you that babies born to um, mothers of lower socioeconomic status, so poorer families really, poorer mothers who are, um, live at high altitude, who live high up in the mountains, well you would think that their babies have a lower birth weight, that's really the assumption um, and that's really what they're talking about here in answer option A. Again the language is slightly different but it's saying the same kind of thing here. Okay, in the question as well, it says the question, the assumption was proved wrong. And it's telling you at the end of the sentence that, well, actually what they found out was that these babies, which were, came from poorer mothers who were born higher in the mountains, actually it tells you these babies were heavier um, than higher income mothers who were uh, higher income, uh, mothers who had higher incomes who were wealthier, who gave birth to, to, to babies in the, the mountains tells you at the bottom, it turns out the difference lies in ancestry as well. Okay. So really you're looking at answer option A, which is the, the correct answer. Now these are this final set of questions we're going to look at. We've looked at detail, we looked at kind of inference. We're going to look at gist here. Now gist is kind of different from detailed questions. Detailed questions you focus on a specific part of the paragraph. You might be able to find the answer in a sentence or two sentences, but GIST is different. In GIST questions, you've got to really understand the whole paragraph. So that's what GIST means. It's getting the general idea of a paragraph. Often you see this in reading part B, as well as reading part C, and you'll see questions which ask you about the main idea or the main point. Often you see these with purpose questions. They want to know why the writer has written this text. What is the point of this text? What is the writer trying to show you? So with GIST questions, it's important that you do understand the whole text, but you don't have to understand every word. You really just need to get the main idea of the paragraph. So this is a direct, this is kind of, it's like the opposite to detailed questions where you're focusing on a specific part of the paragraph. Now you, you're going to look at the paragraph as a whole. Let's look at an example. So let's stick with prenatal origins of heart disease. It's an interesting topic. It says here the purpose of the information in the sixth paragraph is to provide. Well, in a way, you kind of know it's going to be just because it's asking about the purpose here um, and the purpose of the information. In other words, what is this paragraph trying to show you? Why has the writer written this paragraph? This is the paragraph. It says here, the lower socioeconomic groups of La Paz are almost entirely made up of Aymara Indians, 
an ancient ethnic group with a history in the Bolivian highlands spanning a couple of millennia. On the other hand, individuals of higher socioeconomic status represent a largely European and North American admixture, relative newcomers to high altitude. It seems therefore that an ancestry linked to prolonged high altitude residence confers protection against reduced atmospheric oxygen. Okay, these are the answer options. If you wanna take a few seconds uh, just to read through these, uh, feel free to type your answers into the chat. Okay, so let's have a look at this here. This is what the, the paragraph is telling us. Um, in La Paz, in Bolivia, lower socioeconomic groups, so really poorer groups. And it gives an example of the Aymara Indians. And they live in the Bolivian highlands. The highlands, I guess, kind of like being higher areas, like the mountains, if you like. Um, and they've lived there for a couple of millennia, it says here. They've lived there for a long time. On the other hand, and that's really important, you can see where it says on the other hand, because again, it's going to give you contrasting information. It's going to tell you something different, the opposite. So it's, it's just really nice to pick up on these little words. On the other hand, higher socioeconomic um, families, so wealthier families, who are relative newcomers to high altitude. Um, well, it says here, it seems therefore ancestry is linked to prolonged high altitude residents. Uh, it confers protection against reduced atmospheric oxygen. Ancestry is linked to prolonged high altitude residents. All it's saying really is if you've lived in the mountains for a long time, um, you're more likely to be um, protected against uh, oxygen when there is less oxygen. You'll be more suitable to live in mountains if your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents have all lived in the mountains. Uh, but if you're new to the mountains, you're going to struggle more because there's less oxygen. That's really all it's telling you here. That's basically the gist of the paragraph. That's what the writer is saying. When you look at the answer options, nothing about it being a, a puzzle here that's being solved not a confirmation of a hypothesis, no theory was put forward by the writer. Um, and there was no solution to a problem. It, the writer didn't say there's been this problem. Uh, here is the solution, there's nothing there. So the only answer option it has to be is answer option C, an explanation for a finding. Uh, and you might think, well, what is the finding? And it was all there in the last sentence. Ancestry is linked to um, high altitude residents in the mountains, as I was saying earlier. Um, so really what we did, it really helped you just to understand the gist of the paragraph. If you can kind of get the gist of the whole paragraph, it really makes the, the questions a little bit easier. And to get the answer to that, you did really need to understand the, the, the whole paragraph. So you can see how this is different from detailed questions, where detailed questions are very specific and you can focus on a, a certain part of the text. Here, we kind of needed to understand all of this to, to get the correct answer. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do a couple of gist questions, just as before. Um, you'll see the question, you'll get the paragraph, you've got a minute to read it, and then you've got a minute uh, to choose the answers. Okay. So question, here is the paragraph. Good luck.
guys and you can see the answer options. You've got a minute to, um, to select the answers. Remember to look at the whole paragraph as well. Don't just focus on a specific sentence. Okay, let's have a look. Um, migraine, sorry, the second question. Here's your paragraph. Again, you've got um, a minute to read the paragraph and then you'll see the answer options. Okay. All right, so let's look at these two questions. The first question about heart disease. Um, I asked you about the aim of the study here. And again, you've just really got to focus on the question. Make sure you know what they're asking of you. This was asking about the aim of the study. And that's really what you're looking for. If we go through the, the, the paragraph, it talks about um, different pregnancies. Um, in two hospitals, and you've got basically higher and lower income uh, families. That's really what, what the, the study was focusing on. And then if we go on, it talks about Bolivia. It was saying it's split, it's divided. You have areas of high altitude. So you've got these mountainous areas, and then you've got lower areas at sea level. It gives an example then. It talks about um, Santa Cruz and La Paz. Um, and it says they're striking examples of this difference. So Santa Cruz is only 400 metres above sea level, so it's almost uh, pretty much flat really, whereas La Paz, kind of high up in the mountains, 4,000 metres um, above sea level. Um, it says here pregnancies at high altitudes, so pregnancies in La Paz in mountainous areas, they're subjected to lower pastoral pressure of oxygen. There's just basically higher up you are in the mountains, there's less oxygen, they're kind of harder to breathe, in fact. And it says here, women living at high altitude in La Paz, they're more likely to give birth to underweight babies than women living in Santa Cruz. 
Finally, it says this is a result of, is this, in fact, it asks the question as well, is this a result of reduced oxygen in the womb or poorer nutritional status? So really looking at the whole paragraph, you think, what is the gist of this paragraph? Um, what is really the, the purpose of this study? It's all about a study, but what actually is this study? What is it looking at? And that's what you've got to determine. What you notice about the answer options is that they all begin with verbs, uh, to compare, to assess, to find, to determine. Sometimes the verbs are quite similar and you don't really need to pay attention here. Here they're slightly different. And if you look through, well, um, sorry, just if you look at answer option A, it says to compare neonatal records between the UK and Bolivia. You can see there's nothing really there. They're not comparing neonatal records between the UK and Bolivia. So it is actually in, 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 inaccurate. And also, let's go on to B. This talks about two risk factors to assess two risk factors for newborns. And if you look at the bottom of the paragraph, it talked about um, uh, oxygen and it talked about nutrition. And we don't know, actually, this is what the study was trying to find out. The study was trying to find out why women living in, in the mountains in La Paz uh, have underweight babies. Is it because of nutrition or is it because of the oxygen? That was really the focus of the study. And that was the answer to the, the question. But really, to get the answer, you've had to look at the, the whole paragraph. You've had to understand just really generally the, the, the idea of the paragraph. You didn't need to understand every single word, uh, but as long as you kind of get the main idea. OK, this is question two. It was about migraines. And um, once again, let's have a look. You, you might notice, again, looking at the answer options, they all begin with verbs again. Normally what I do is I just quickly underline the verbs as well and the answer options just to kind of help me focus. You've got explain, address, illustrate, clarify. So they're all slightly different, these verbs. Explain causes of migraine aura. You've got address the fear surrounding migraine aura. Uh, illustrate the strange nature of migraine auras or clarify a misunderstanding about migraine auras. Okay, they're all about migraine auras. You can actually just take them out. Uh, you don't really need to focus on them. They're in all of the answer options. So in a way, that's really what you're looking at. Um, why does the writer tell the story of the news reporter to explain causes, to address the fears, uh, to illustrate, to show how strange these, these migraine auras are, or because the writer's trying to clarify a misunderstanding. So again, we're gonna to have to read the whole, understand the whole paragraph. Um, it's not a detailed question. You're not just gonna find this in a sentence or in half the paragraph. You're gonna to have to really just understand the whole paragraph. The first half of the paragraph, it talks about the news reporter. The news reporter was giving a, um, a live commentary. Again, you can see in the first sentence, they have the word unintelligible. And again, you can see how important vocabulary is to reading part C, uh, unintelligible. So basically they couldn't understand. If, if something is unintelligible, it means you can't understand. So they couldn't understand this news reporter. Suddenly she became unintelligible. Uh, something strange happened. They thought she had a stroke. Others thought she, she'd been drinking um, or she was on drugs or, or some, um, but she said, basically, I just had a headache. And that's what it's telling you in the first part of the, the paragraph. So it's telling you what happened to the news reporter. Then it goes on to explain that the, the, um, the speech difficulties um, were actually symptoms of an aura migraine. And they talk about other symptoms as well. Uh, visual or a, a visual, there are blind spots, you have flashing, there's zigzagging or sparkling as well. And really kind of that's what it's telling you about then. So why, why is the writer, why do they tell you the story of the news reporter? Okay, so looking at the paragraph at the heart as a whole, the writer wasn't explaining the causes. It wasn't, didn't want to, uh, didn't tell us about this news reporter. So we understand why, the, why people have migraine auras. So you can rule out option A, 
it's not to address fears as well, nothing there. Uh, with B, there's nothing about a misunderstanding. You might, because you have the word unintelligible in the first sentence, people are sometimes put down option D, but you've really got to just focus on the question. Um, and if you do that, you'll see really what they're trying to do is illustrate. They're just trying to show you how strange migraine auras are. Um, there are some things in there which can help you. Unintelligible live TV commentary, um, a bizarre speech difficulties, odd disturbances. They're telling you this is really something strange. It's unusual. Uh, these are kind of normal headaches. You know, you see things and hallucinate. It's, they're, they're really unusual. And that's really what the writer is trying to tell you. And that's why the writer used the example of the news report as well. Again, it's a gist question. To get the answer, you've really got to look at the whole paragraph here. Okay. Okay, guys. So really, if we just recap on a couple of points, because we've done quite a lot of work in the, in the, in the past hour, and just some tips. Make sure you always understand the questions in reading part C. Underline the verbs um, and really think, what are they asking you as well? One mistake people make is that because they see something in the text, they think that that's the answer. Option B says this and option B is in the text, but it doesn't answer the question. So make sure you understand the question. It's really important. And think, um, you know, you might have to infer if it's a gist question, you may have to infer. And even if it's a detailed question, you may have to infer as well. So it's a good skill to have. Um, remember, you're going to have to read between the lines. It's not always obvious there. So be prepared to infer. Think also, remember that the language in the answer options is different from the language in the text as well. So think about synonyms, think about synonymous language. Um, read the whole text. That's really important, even if it's a detailed question where you can find the answer in the first half of the paragraph, just make sure you read the whole text because you never know. And that's true with part B and C, just really important. You read the whole paragraph. Um, understand the general meaning. So we talked about gist questions. Remember, you don't need to understand every word to get the gist. You just really wanna get the main idea. This is really useful for reading part B as well. And in part B, they often ask you the purpose. What's the purpose of this email? What's the purpose of this document? Or it asks you about the main idea. So think about the gist, just getting the general idea of a paragraph as well. Uh, think about the strategies that we've used as well. Remember, uh, we looked at the reading the questions, then we went to the paragraph, and then we looked at the answer options. That's really important. Uh, it might help you, it might not, but give it a go. Everyone's different and you need to experiment as you prepare for the OET exam. That's why preparation is so important. See if it works for you and try and find something that works for you. Some people just like to read uh, the answer options first, then the paragraph, and that's fine. If that works for you, go ahead and do that. But remember, this is reading comprehension. And if you can really comprehend, if you can understand the paragraph, it makes the answer options easier. Okay, build up vocabulary. We've talked about this before as well. Uh, the more vocabulary you have, the easier it is. And that's also true with listening, um, part A, B and C, in fact. Um, and also you see, sometimes you have quite an unusual word and they trip you up because if you don't understand this unusual word, it's difficult to get the answer. So really just build up your vocabulary. And finally, just read as well. It's strange to say that, but this is a reading exam. And like any skill, if you wanna be good at something, just need to practice it. If you wanna be good at swimming, you need to go swimming. If you wanna be good at, um, you know, tennis, you've got to play tennis. If you want to be good at reading, you've got to read. And that's something you really need to do. I meet people who have really good English and then they fail the reading paper. And it's partly because they, they never really read. So just read as much as you can as you prepare for this OET exam. There's some really good websites. There's a British medical journal, the BMJ. 
and you find free articles there. There's stuff on the BBC if you look at health and science, and there's stuff in newspapers as well. Uh, all of this stuff can, can really help you. Just read as much as you can and get in the habit of reading. Okay, just to remind you, if you go to our website, wles.net, you'll find 20% off all our courses, uh, but only until March the 15th. So there's only another week left of this offer. We've been running it a week and there's only another week left. If you like, just scan this QR code. You can see this barcode um, in the top right hand side of your, the top right hand corner of your screen. In fact, if you just scan that, that will take you directly to, uh, to the relevant pages. Okay, and you'll find stuff there. If you need help with reading, you'll find reading courses there. There's video lessons, there's practice as well. There's some really good material there. Um, there's stuff with listening lessons as well. And uh, we've got writing, online writing courses, writing correction service as well. This is a popular one. Um, you basically, we send you case notes, you send us a letter and we send you back detailed feedback as well. Um, there's lots of things there, speaking courses as well, um, online as well. We also have writing packages uh, for doctors and for nurses as well. The platinum package is probably the most comprehensive one. Uh, this is the one that most people go for. Um, it really has got everything in there that you need to pass this exam. And you'll work with a tutor as well. Um, it's not like you're just gonna buy a package and then you go off and study by yourself. Actually, there is a tutor who will work with you uh, throughout uh, the time you're doing this course. So check it all out, 20% off uh, everything. This is who we are, if you don't know already. Um, it's me on the left, Beth Stacy. she's in the middle, uh, the Assistant Director of Studies, and hopefully you'll get to work with Beth again um, when we do another live class. On the right, you'll see Catalin as well. Catalin, she's an interlocutor here. She, she does the exam kind of invigilation for OET here in London. And just a reminder as well that we are open as well. So coming to the school, um, the school has been open. We opened up again on Monday. It's great. So here um, we're getting back to normal. We are running classes. Uh, so if you want face to face courses, then please just come in, come and have a chat with us, email us as well. Um, or give us a call. Uh, we are here. We love talking about OET. If you just need some advice or anything, if you just want to talk about OET, then please get in touch. Uh, but if you are here in London, then please do come in. Uh, come and have a coffee with us. Um, we'll, we'll kind of talk to you um, and we'll do our best to guide you as well. OK, guys, so that's it to today. Um, we'll, we'll see you next week uh, at a slightly earlier time. Uh, stay well, take care wherever you are, look after yourselves. If you are doing the exam, you're doing the exam in April or you're doing the exam fairly soon, then good luck. Um, and we'll, we'll see you again soon. Take care. It's nice to, nice to work with you.